Welcome to the Virtual Excellence Show, where we speak to amazing people about excellence in all things virtual. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Megan Elliott, who is, uh, amongst other things, the uh, director, founding director of the uh, Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media, uh, which we're going to hear about soon, and has an illustrious history in connecting arts and media people worldwide to create amazing things. So to introduce uh, Megan properly, we'll just play a short video. You don't walk blindly into the future, you actually imagine it and invent it. This could only have happened in Nebraska because of the bold vision, because of the commitment to success and to excellence that UNL has, because we're scrappy, and because of what's come before, because it actually has been built on the back of 20 years of a really fabulous film and theatre program, and that's, that's why it could only happen here. I've always said that innovation happens on the margins, and the fact is, is the margins in this country happen to be in the middle. We have the opportunity to be bold here, and so I think we're able to move really fast. I truly believe that we have the opportunity to bring a better future into being, if not us, who? What a fabulous video. Thank you. So, Lincoln, Nebraska. It's uh, not a big city, I think. Um, fantastic that you're doing, doing all of this from there. Well, the University of Nebraska Lincoln is a 150 year old public land grant institution and we're a research one university. We're part of the Big Ten Academic and Sporting Conference. So, um, you know, we have some clout. It's a, it's a university um, with multiple campuses, a graduate and undergraduate programs, obviously about 36,000 students and in a community of about 300,000 people. Wow. So, so it sounds like a very, very much a university town in that case. Yeah, larger than many university towns. Right. So, so it is interesting in the, the virtual excellence space. So you're creating something uh, world-class center for emerging media and arts. And, you know, presumably it's been a little harder for people to get on the plane and visit there. So how are you working with your students, with your faculty, with the, the people who are coming to engage with you? How's, how's that all working? Well, um, mostly online, but some in person. So we resumed uh, in August, uh, the university's open. Uh, we're offering online classes, in-person classes, asynchronous and, and synchronous web conferencing classes. So we're doing all of those things. But we've always, ever since we opened our doors last August in 2019, we've always Zoomed people in. You know, um, I have an international network and an international reputation, so that was mm -hmm. always engaged here. Um, back then, though, that we, we were pro probably the only people that were Zooming in. Now, of course, every the last thing you need is another Zoom meeting. But um, that, that's how we're doing it. I'm excited for next semester as well because we have a very good partnership with HP and some of our virtual reality and mixed reality um, courses will all be uh, virtual in the virtual space um, and really um, starting to use those kinds of, explore those social spaces as spaces for learning inside VR. So, I mean, yeah, a lot of, lot of threads I want to pick up on from there. And uh, I suppose one of the first ones is for those who are watching who don't know, you have an unparalleled global network through your long, yeah. uh, long experience with the Cross Media Lab all over yep. the world, bringing together yes. amazing people to, to great things. So that's, that's obviously far, you know, part of the great value you bring to your role. So, so how are you tapping your amazing global network in, in your current role? Well, um, I've put together a pretty extraordinary advisory council, which includes people like um, Ted Shilowitz, the futurist of Paramount Pictures. Um, it includes the Beijing Film Academy, 
Shaker Kapoor, the filmmaker, um, Alex McDowell, who is a narrative designer on Fight Club and Minority Report and has since established the World Building Institute at USC School of Cinematic Arts. Uh, Madeline Donono, who's the CEO of the Gina Davis Institute of Gender Equity and Media, Australia's own, although she is an international presence, Lynette Walworth, um, an artist who just, just won an Emmy actually for her virtual um, reality piece called A Webinar. Um, so it's it's pretty, it's an exciting advisory council. I brought some of them out here together in um, May of 2017 to start to really explore and put the bones on the curriculum um, to ask the question, what does it mean to create a brand new program in an age of artificial intelligence? Um, we, I also use them for guest lectures. Um, we're actually collaborating with um, Alex McDowell at uh, USC and a university in Argentina on a collaborative world build about the future of youth, youth activism and youth empowerment, which is exciting. So I engage with them regularly. I also report into the, or update the Johnny Carson Foundation every month and work closely with Robert Tursek, also a futurist um, on those updates. So I feel really supported uh, by these industry legends. Um, Australia's own Joel Edgerton, actually, we just had a cast party watching his, one of his films and then he zoomed in to talk to us too about staying, being creative and remaining creative in the time of COVID. And then last Friday, I zoomed in um, Marg Helgenberg, who's an actress on All Rise. You may remember her from China Beach and CSI. She's a Nebraska native and also um, has just gone back into production for All Rise. So speaking to her again about Co protocols in the time of COVID. And I think critically and crucially for our students about how to remain creative, how to remain feeling connected in a time when it's easy to feel really disconnected or, or a kind of even cognitive dissonance by using these web conferencing tools all the time. So I put them to work in answer to your question. <laughs> Very good. So again, lots of threads I want to pick up on. Uh, one you mentioned a collaborative world build. Tell me about that. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, I'm excited. Um, and um, one of the things I said at the launch of the Carson Centre is that everybody has been pinging me and, and saying, come on, you know, open your doors. We want to come and play. And so finally we can because finally I have faculty and I have recruited two cohorts of students so this will be, um, the collaboration will be an innovation studio and we're just learning without working with Alex what it will look like. But students in Buenos Aires, students in Los Angeles and students here will do a speculative design or world building. Um, we're not too sure what it is yet and, and to share that out. But world building or speculative design is very much that idea that we get to bring the future into being by designing better worlds or different worlds. It's a... Um, coin, it's a term that Alex coined actually when he was brought on as the narrative director for Minority Report at the same time the scriptwriter was brought on. And so he had to go and design this world with all of its own, own inherent logic um, be, for a script to be taken, narratives to be taken from it. And that film actually has produced about 100 patents. Um, John Onderkoffler from MIT was the chief scientist on that and he has gone on to form Oblong Industries that kind of envisioned Uber and mobile phones, touchscreen phones and that fabulous, you know, gestural interface that is now second nature to us, but 20 years ago we'd never seen. So, so this idea that artists can work alongside engineers or architects to bring new and better realities into being. That, that's fantastic. And I love, love yeah. particularly that that's... Uh happening across uh, nations and uh, around the world. Exactly. Doing it together. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you're also just saying, okay, this thing around how, you know, for helping students and uh, presumably faculty as well, saying, well, how is it that not only you remain engaged, but also how do you remain creative in yeah. when you are, you know, potentially stuck in a room in front of a, a screen and a, and a video camera. So, yeah. What, what are some of the answers to that? What, are, Look, what have you uncovered, I suppose? We're exploring and experimenting all the time. Students report that they can feel very, have huge levels of anxiety by seeing themselves on camera and on screens all the time. So often they'll choose to 
turn the uh, screens off. And so we're measuring engagement through how they might respond to questions in chat or how they um, engage in interactive experiences through their learning management system. We're going to start to also do work inside Mozilla Hubs. When, uh, when we closed in March earlier this year, because of COVID, we just rebuilt the Carson Centre inside Mozilla Hubs and each student then built out their own room and, uh, you know, dropped in their films that they'd made in Unity and their world builds and other things, animations. And so we held the cast, we, we held our open studio virtually. But we also even, for example, hired the same DJ we would have hired if it was in person. And he, he streamed live on Twitch and we dropped that in. So it was, it was fantastic. It was actually a really liminal kind of experience was the word that we kind of came up with. So we're trying different things to engage people. Um, I, as I said, I've used the platform cast.gg, founded by um, fellow Australian Marco Lila and his partner, um, which is a great premium streaming platform where pe people can watch things together and comment and and do that. Um, yeah, we're trying all different kinds of things to engage our students. We try many students come in and actually will be on Zoom learning but then with their masks on six feet away from another student so at least they're then in um, community together and it, I've been amazed at them that you know everyone is I mean our blood is turning into hand sanitizer like <laughs> it's just crazy um, but they'll disinfect everything they, there's no problem with mask wearing um, they uh, obey the protocols it's it's pretty phenomenal what young people are doing in their resilience right now that, that, that's awesome any yeah. any particular reason you chose Mozilla Hubs as opposed to any other sort of platforms for a virtual space? Because I believe in the Mozilla mission and um, I like that they believe in the commons and that it's open source. It's really easy to use, drag and drop. Um, you can build things very quickly using this, using Spoke. So, so that's why um, we had a bit of um, – it's also their vision of the future, the metaverse – I think it's just, you know, it's our data is private. Um, as I say, it's open source, as the commons, it's it just has a much better ethical basis, I think. Yeah, yeah, well, it's certainly been in the foundations. <laughs> I was just looking back at the, uh, yeah. trying to find the first uh, wo website in the world for my daughter. <laughs> and, uh, and right. Sort of, yeah, there's a few pre Mozilla, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, good, goodness, I can remember Cyworld from Korea back in 2006, but, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, have a hotel. But yeah, uh, the yeah. other thing is that, that um, the great thing about Mozilla is that, um, you know, the Online News Association has been working with it. So our students actually got internships to go into um, help facilitate other conferences happening online at Mozilla Hub. So they had a hub crawl, not a pub crawl. <laughs> And, um, and the other thing too is I think because while we, we were working with Ben Crimer, who's a creative technologist in residence, we were doing this in three weeks. And so when the Mozilla Hubs community manager and head dev came in to visit, they were like, what? <laughs> like, like, it should be broken. Like, we, we really threw our sheer exuberance and um, and just not knowing better, we should have broken the platform. So they were really, really happy that, that it was much more resilient than they thought it was going to be. So, so yeah, <laughs> if you want anything tested, send it our way. All right. I'll, 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 all right. I'll probably take you up on that. Yeah. So, so virtual excellence is our theme. And so I'd love to just hear, are there any artists, faculty, students, whatever, doing anything oh. with uh, AR or VR or extension of our senses or connectivity yep. or remote stuff, Any anything which oh. you'd uh, share with us? Look, all the things. We're doing all the things. Um, we are part of the HP EduCourse Campus of the Future consortia, if you will, which means that I get some pretty amazing equipment and kit from HP and they also... Personally, the CTO of VR, Paul Martin for HP, spec'd out my VR lab, which is fantastic. It's like totally future-proof. And 
the areas that we're exploring, and actually one of the reasons I was attracted to this role in the first place is that it's not just about entertainment, but the recognition that media is an industry building industry and that emerging media arts are part of every industry. And my goal is for our students to either be able to realise the job of their dreams or raise money to start the company of their dreams straight out of school. And for me to be successful, not only do I need them to go and be, you know, fabulous in Hollywood or Beijing or Shanghai, but I also need people to stay and build businesses here. And it's quite likely that the businesses they build here in Nebraska will not be primarily entertainment businesses, but they might be VR businesses that work with insurance companies or data visualization or with architecture firms, companies, businesses and industries that are already well established here alongside, of course, agribusiness and, um, and, and sports analysis, sports analytics. So, so th those, those things. Um, and we are, we have starting to get a bit of a heat map around VR and embodiment and what that means and looking at that in terms of wellness. So that's something that Professor Jesse Fleming has started and he's set up a lab here called the Perceptual Technologies, Technologies Lab and he works around mindfulness. Um, I've just hired Professor Robert Tomei. I hired Jesse away from Stanford actually. I've just hired Professor Robert Tomei and he has just got a $750,000 grant from the National Science Foundation to look at, at te using AR, the efficacy of using AR to teach STEM. So he's a co-principal investigator of that. Um, we are all engaged with um, Unity and uh, um, Unreal and looking at real-time filmmaking um, processes for animatics, but also to build virtual worlds. Professor Jingtu Kim works with sound and um, immersive and inter interactive sound and projection um, and, and in virtual spaces. Um, Professor Ash Smith is my big world building person and she works across all of those platforms. And Professor Anna Henson, whom I must do, you should get her on this show because currently um, you should get any of them on the show. She is a professor by day, but of an evening, actually tonight, um, she is a host inside VR chat for HBO's Lovecraft Country. They've got these um, uh, invitation-only uh, um, influencer VR experience, social VR experiences using VR chat. And tonight she's hosting Janelle Monae um, doing a, wow. uh, a virtual conference. So I like to I like to think think of my professors as you know professors by day, but you know superheroes by night, and they're engaged with industry. So. And interestingly, we are the only undergraduate emerging media arts program which is co-located in uh, the same space as our dance program. And so one of the things we talk about is dance is actually an embodied media. And yes. you think about dance and kinesiology, the somatic arts, um, yoga, Pilates, all of these, because wellness as an industry is only getting bigger. Yeah. And so I'm very interested in how we are creating a little bit little bit of a heat map around embodiment and performance and VR, for example. You, you're doing and actually, I'll just, Go on. I just want to finish that. I found it really interesting that when I go to Sundance to the New Frontiers and Sundance Film Festival, they have a New Frontiers program, which is primarily around VR experiences, that the ones that which engage in social spaces, so you're in the VR experience with other people simultaneously, the best execution involves dance and it's really interesting because there's a choreographer and I should know his name out of Geneva who's pioneering this stuff because what happens is you're dancing you know you're dancing in space there are other people in space and then of course there are AI or generated bodies also in space da dancing so you don't know if you don't know which bodies are uh, generational or, or generated and which bodies are real and then others, Gabor Aurora's piece with Dancing with Sufis. And I think it's because every culture knows how to dance, you know, and it, it, this holy grail within, well, a holy grail within virtual, within the virtual space, of course, is embodiment and how do we feel and does that promote learning, et cetera. You don't, you don't have a, a, you can't remember a reference for that? Because that sounds fascinating. Um, I can find one and you can put it in the notes. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah, do that. would be good because, I, I mean, I, I, I definitely want to check that out. Oh, no, I was just going to ask yeah, you, are you yeah. doing anything with avatar mapping? Uh, what do you mean avatar well, mapping? As in, as in mapping oh, bodies, mapping. including dancers and so on, and mapping them onto avatars? 
Yes, yep. So we haven't we haven't yet because we're still building um, our mocap studio. We're still very much building the plane as we're flying it, but that is a big um, that, that that's a big part of emerging media arts and and what we're doing. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's just one of the yeah, foundational yeah. frontiers for yeah. being able to yeah. you know get some awesome stuff in in VR. Exactly. But it's also like, so I'm at the moment, I'm very fortunate. I'm able to hire, which at this stage of the world is kind of unheard of. But so I've actually been speaking with the chief creative people from uh, Unity and last week, and I'm connecting up with uh, Unreal this week. And of course, um, uh, the Unity for Humanity Summit is on oh, yeah. this week, which I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait for that. But it's that thing about when you're looking at these game engines, um, you know, the whole well, the creative goal is that it will automate using AI in these virtual game engines all of the boring, laborious, labour-intensive garbage stuff yep. like rigging a character and making it run around um, and that AI will be doing that. So I was really trying to feel out um, how long until that's, you know, a robust part of the pipeline because... Um, that's that's that you know I'm always trying to stay right on that edge, and that's hard in a big institution uh, where you want to keep people really fresh. But that's what will set us apart um, from the rest of the industry, the rest so, of, you know, from the, the other the other colleges. And so, and so, what have you learned about that uh, specific thing around uh, the AI and? It's coming. And, it's <laughs> yeah. It's it's here. It's already here, but it's 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 coming more and more robustly i mean you can only imagine what i mean you know unreal epic games are just i mean they, they're covered in money like it's you know i mean because of Fortnite. so it's not like they're, they're uh, strapped for cash when it comes to the the r d that they're doing for unreal you know i think it's real it's a really exciting time and i think it's also interesting i was speaking to the former uh GM of Paramount last week as well, I get to speak to some cool people, <laughs> you know, in my sure. job. And and it's that, you know, I, the pundit like Scott Galloway that I really like, he talks about how um, COVID is an accelerant for 10 years and yet in the media industries it may be an accelerant of 20. And Mark talked about it how, you know, um, the media modules would sit around and say, oh, we're going to be out of this game before the, the – well, the cinemas close, right? You know, twenty years away. Well, the cinemas are closing now. Yeah. So what? You know, so it's, all, it's like twenty years is here today, and I think that we'll be seeing that with virtual production and real time filmmaking because that's the only way people have been able to do it. And so then companies like HP win an Emmy award because their real time filmmaking and edge computing enables Hollywood to finish out production on Trolls or whatever it was um, when. Previously, previously, they couldn't, even though the technology was there, you know, the concerns about IP and privacy, et cetera, and now, and now they can. So now it doesn't matter that I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is five hours from New York, not 25, Ross, um, because we can make this from anywhere. You know, I'm yeah. on an Internet 2 backbone, yep. part of CERN, you know, with a massive supercomputing centre. It doesn't, doesn't matter. At least I'm out of the fires. Totally. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, again, you know, really exciting stuff. So much to, to play with there. Just, I mean, just speculating. So thinking about, you know, future of entertainment, you know, what goes after classic flat screen in cinema <laughs> and yeah. to your immersive, interactive and potentially participatory type uh, entertainment. I mean, I'd love to just hear any thoughts you have on that. Yeah. Um, well, there, the companies are investing in it, right? So uh, the creators of headsets, they're still quite bullish. Um, I think you know, Oculus has led the way in some ways for having you know, a non-tethered experience, but you're bound into the Facebook garden. So that's something that I would not encourage our students to do. Um, so so the, the kit is coming and it'll be cheaper and faster and better. Um, so I think that's coming. And I, then I, and I think the other thing is, is wearables. I mean, people are talking again about, you know, something like Google Glass, but not Google Glass. Um, 
and that that's where we'll be going. I think the great thing about VR is particularly around um, training, health, education. Um, that's where I see really great applica applications for it. When it comes to entertainment experiences, um, games, I haven't, I haven't experienced incredible, incredible experiences in VR. The question always for me is what compels it to be in this medium? What, yep. what experience compels it? And, and I think all of us, because we're just learning this right now, I've been saying for years, learning the grammar of how we make this stuff um, and why, but, but importantly, why we make it. Um, that, that's something that we're all still feeling our way forward. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's still, you know, as one, one of many who is bullish on VR for quite a long time, it's yeah. been pretty disappointing the last two or three years in terms of consumer up, uptake. As you say, there's many, yeah. many commercial applications and those are doing really well uh, in the VR and AR. And still the consumer VR is, hasn't, hasn't hit it yet. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think... Let's see, let's see. I think Steam and Valve can help us learn where it's going and, and who they're bullish with in terms of their partners. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, we're, you know, we're just working out ecosystems, all kinds of things. I mean, I'm excited by the LiDAR scanning and yep. things like that that are in the new iPads, which are making, um, making things much easier for our students. You know, they do a lot of their AR on the, on the iOS. Um yeah, but, you know, geolocating stories finally is really easy in terms of podcasts. In actual fact, Sean Stewart, who's on my advisory council, he was the co-creative director of Xbox with Elan Lee and a published science fiction writer, et cetera, and he said that the very first project you should do in Story Lab is get your students to write a radio play because they're really hard to do. And I think that um, the... And they are actually. They've just. I, mean, I can't. I'm excited to see this week some of our first year students first forays into podcasting, um, because uh, a lot of these that kind of technology is also really great for down and dirty prototyping about what's compelling um, to before you you know start to work on something with a much greater budget. So so I'm I'm excited by. Uh, by audio culture uh, and, and podcasting and its boom to, um, to be used as prototypes for other things. Fantastic. So, so that's a round out by looking to the future. Um, I suppose it lets lead the intersection of the future of emerging media arts and uh, the Johnny Center, the Carson Center, mm -hmm. where, where, what's, uh, what's coming up? Ah, well, uh, we're still building. Um, we still, I'm still actually physically building the building <laughs> in some aspects and hiring and hiring and developing recruitment plans for students and internship experiences for them. Um, where we've got the funding to do a conference slash festival within the next couple of years. That's kind of derailed cu currently for COVID. But we're treating it very much like a startup. So if the company is the Carson Centre, then one of my product, product lines is um, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Emerging Media Arts. And so we're, we're, we've been going at that for two years, so we're about to pull that apart again and um, not pivot, as we say, but refine. It was a prototype, so it's, it's time to refine it and to, to keep it fresh all the time. And just what really informed our thinking when, when we were starting this in twenty. Well, I came on in 2017. Obviously, the Johnny Carson Foundation committed the 20 million prior to that. Is that we are designing a brand new centre and a brand new degree program in an age of intelligent machines, right? Where our students are going to have to be facile with machines and to be able to work alongside them. So I was really um, impacted by a book called Robot Proof: Higher Education in the Age of um, Machine Intelligence, and and that for us to be successful, what we all need to do is to really develop four new cognitive capacities. And one is critical thinking, systems thinking, uh, entrepreneurship and cultural agility. So we mapped those, critical thinking to design, systems thinking to code, computational media, entrepreneurship and cultural agility to storytelling. So we like to say that we're creating, you know, X-shaped graduates. Um, but I think that 
that those, if we can instill those capacities in our students, they'll thrive and be ready for anything. So, um, so that's what we're doing. We're building students who will be able to, you know, realise the job of their dreams or raise money to start the company of their dreams straight out of school. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm a big, big believer in that. And um, don't know, back from my future media summits, you know, when people were already beginning to sort of get nervous <laughs> in various sectors of the media, it says, you know, anybody that is really skilled in media has a wonderful future. It may not be in a for you know what we think of as media roles of the past but those the yeah. we are humans and communicators you know exactly. we, we you know and so there's these are foundational skills for who we are and particularly in the fast yeah. moving world so i'm sure yeah. that any of the you know the, the people you heard the, the the people who graduate from your school i think we're going to be admirably prepared for the rest of the century yeah and and to feel connected it doesn't matter that they're in lincoln and and I think it's really yes. important that we are here. I think it does matter to this place. Everyone wants us to win because when we win, everyone else does too. And, you know, again, I was just to drop another name from a great height, but I was speaking to the having a meeting with the chief scientist of Dolby, Poppy Crumb, and she took this meeting and I was amazed. I thought, wow. And I was talking to her about the program and she said, what you're doing is really, really important. I'm from Iowa. And I think that recognition right. that students don't have to leave the Midwest or go to the coast or get into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt yes. and yet can have that same kind of education, I think is fant I think it's unparalleled. It's fantastic. We're a research one la public land grant university. So we don't charge, we don't extort students, you know, uh, we set them up for success. So, so yeah, that's why I'm here. Absolutely. And I, I think that is a key part of that virtual world story is that, yes, the people will still, talent will still congregate in New York's and LA's and whatever's, but yeah. there's so much more opportunity to be incredibly talented, work with incredibly talented people, wherever somebody builds a cluster, yeah. uh, which you are yeah. doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know it'll take time. <laughs> Good on you. Fantastic. So fantastic to, to hear uh, a little bit of what you're, where you've got to so far and obviously a lot further to go. Um, really keen to follow the story. So thanks so much for sharing your story with uh, the Virtual Excellence Show, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. So Megan Elliott sharing uh, the story of the Johnny Corson uh, Merging Media Arts Centre and all they're doing in virtual and uh, Augmented Worlds, I think there's a few really interesting themes there around education, around staying connected, and also around, of course, the, the ways in which these play out in the future of uh, media. So, of course, if you have liked the show, please like it, add a comment, and uh, subscribe to the show because there'll be plenty of more great content coming. Thanks so much to being a viewer of the Virtual Excellence Show.